Welcome everyone to my teaching demo on editing. Before we begin, I'd like to establish a couple assumptions about the classroom itself. First of all, this is a large lecture classroom with about 350 students and 25 TAs. Students will come to class having already read the chapter on editing. Additionally, they can access my website which provides supplemental information. Each TA runs a Facebook group with about 12 to 14 students. Students are required to submit questions before class to this Facebook group and TAs will consolidate those questions and present them to me so that I can prepare those questions for lecture. Additionally, students can submit questions to the Facebook group during lecture and TAs will constantly feed me a stream of questions so that I can respond to interests or confusion in real time. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy my teaching demo. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about editing, uh, specifically continuity editing, although we'll look at some of the questions you all had. Um, so my TAs told me that um, there were three main questions that continually came up um, during the discussion after you read the chapter. First one is about Kuleshov effect. What is that? I'll, I'll sort of get into that in a second. Um, the second thing you all wanted to know about was master scene or master shot technique. What is that? We'll get to that as well. Okay. And the third thing, uh, some people were questioning, um, it seems like you understood generally what match cuts were. Um, but you generally wanted to see an example or know more about the gra what a graphic match is. So we can, we can do all that. Um, I'd like to start talking about the Kuleshov effect because I think that's a really great way to get into a discussion of editing and what editing really is. Um, so in, in your chapter, the, the, the book talks about the Kuleshov effect um, being this juxtaposing of images and the ways in which uh, juxtaposing two separate images that do not have any contextual ties um, will suddenly create in your mind a contextual link. Okay, so um, here's an example, an early example of the Kuleshov effect. Um, and as you can see here, we have image of a man's face and he's wearing a neutral expression. Okay, so first we get the object, in this case a dead girl, or a girl in a casket, I'm assuming she's alive. And then the man's face, okay. Uh, the third example is a beautiful woman and a man's face. Okay, and then we get a bowl of soup and a man's face. Okay. What was really sort of groundbreaking at the time with regards to the Kuleshov effect is that when he showed these different clips to different audiences, the audiences read a different expression from the man's face. Okay, so in the first example with the dead child, or the child in a casket, um, audiences swore that that man had a sad look on his face. Okay. In the second example with the woman on the couch, or the fainting couch, um, audiences swore he had a look of, of passion or lust on his face. And in the final example, audiences said that he looked hungry. Okay. Um, and Kuleshov found this sort of remarkable because it was the same clip each time, same clip of the man's face. So what, the, what this effect does is it shows us that when you juxtapose two clips together, your brain will automatically assume connection and meaning to those. This is the fundamental logic of editing, okay? because we know that if we put two images together, you'll, you'll make that connection yourself. Editing then picks up on that and says, okay, we can transport people time in space, um, we can put things out of order, and the brain is going to naturally sort of make connections for us. All right? This is why the Kuleshov effect is important, because it, 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 it's sort of the axiom of the entire logic of editing that we're going to talk about today. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions on the Kuleshov effect. Um, I said today the main thing I wanted to talk about was continuity editing. And I think continuity editing is, is really important, discontinuity editing as well, but we have to sort of first understand continuity before we can understand discontinuity. Um, so I've prepared a clip um, from Once Upon a Time in the West. And uh, this clip, I want to sort of walk us through it slowly. Okay. Um, and point out where we see continuity editing happening um, and how Leone makes meaning using just image. Okay? There is sound in this clip, there's no dialogue in this clip. 
or sorry, I missed them. There's one line of dialogue in the entire internet clip. Okay. Um, what's important for you to note here is how Leone is trying to tell a specific type of story. Uh, when we think of westerns, we frequently think about gun battles, right, and duels and stuff like that. And Leone has these, these moments in his films. However, Leone is obsessed not with the gun battle itself, but with everything that goes into building that moment. What brings these two men together, okay, and, and puts them in this position where they're ready to unleash violence on each other, okay? What are the backstories? What's the history? And for Leone, this, this redemptive, the redemptive power of violence, the ability for violence to solve a problem, is sort of specious, and he doesn't, I, I, I don't believe he actually trusts it too much. And so what his films frequently do is spend seven minutes and 45 seconds building to the gunfight. The gunfight's over in a flash, and then we have very little time to reflect on it, okay? And in doing this, he, he, he creates uh, a sort of a sense of that violence as being not what the gun battle is actually about, okay? But we're focused on continuity editing here. So, like I said, I want to walk us through this clip, so I'll pause at, at important moments. The clip begins um, with Frank, the man dressed in black, as the only figure on the screen, okay? Uh, Harmonica, our hero of the story, is off screen to the right. As the clip starts, Harmonica will move on screen. This is what, you've, uh, what I've talked about before as being open framing versus closed framing. In open frame, a character can enter and exit the boundaries of the camera, whereas a closed frame, the, cam the character is, is located fixed on the camera. Um, so Frank is closed frame, Harmonica is open frame. Harmonica will enter right to left, and that right to left movement is where we're going to see uh, the first stage of this continuity editing. Everything in this scene moves right to left, even when the characters are standing still. So that first cut we get is another, is, is another instance of continuity editing. We'll talk about the 180 degree rule in just a second. But for now, notice that the first shot, Frank was in the center of the screen and Harmonica entered right to left. In our reverse shot, Frank is still to the left of Harmonica. Harmonica remains on the right of, of Frank. This is important and the entire first part of this scene ret uh, retains that continuity of Harmonica on the right, Frank on the left. This is, this is uh, a, a part of continuity editing where the characters stay in the same portion of the screen. Okay, very important. Now they've changed positions here, but it's, it happens on camera. Okay, so this is still part of the logic. The crane shot pulls us up so that we can see Harmonica and Frank in their location. The, the, the landscape becomes important at this moment, or Leone emphasizes it. And with this long shot, we're meant to take in the characters as part of their landscapes. Okay? So if you notice, Harmonica on the left sort of blends in with, with the background landscape, right? His colors and tones match that natural earthiness, okay? Whereas Frank's wearing all black, okay? Uh, this, this is very important because in the, throughout the story, right, Frank is trying to build this railroad through this town, and that's his main goal and the main thing that Harmonica is preventing him from doing. And so, you know, Frank even drops his coat here, forcing us to pay attention to the clothing. Um, again, notice this right-to-left movement that Leone continues. Throughout, throughout edits. As we cut close and far away, the right to left continues to happen. Even Harmonica is standing still. Even though he's standing still, we still get a right to left movement here in the frame.
Okay, and so the continuity breaks here. Notice that Charles Bronson's character moves left to right now. This is Leone's way of signaling that that first introductory part of the scene is over. And that what's, what's happening next is the secondary, is the second moment of this scene. And what the second moment is, is about building that history between the two characters. That so far, the audience understands that Harmonica is angry with Frank, but doesn't yet know why. And so Leone's about to, about to tip his reveal here of that backstory. The moving in also signals an intimacy. Frank is stationary. This is not an intimate moment for him, but for Harmonica it very much is. And so here's another moment of continuity. How do we distinguish visually that we're about to enter into someone's head? In a novel, we can easily write in a different uh, person, uh, a different, uh, so maybe first or third person perspective, um, or we can give some kind of indication that this is a person's thought, simply by using John thought, right? But in a visual medium, there's no real way to indicate that we're now inside someone's head, okay? So what Leone does here to indicate that we're moving from an external scene to inside of a character's head, inside of a memory, is with this slow pulling. Throughout this film, we've seen this sort of this image repeated frequently as Harmonica remembers or dreams, but we haven't seen the character's face yet. And so this is the moment when it becomes revealed that that character, that shadowy man that's walking up, is Frank, is the, is the man in black. Okay. And so this is sort of a large reveal. Notice how clothing and, shade and, and sort of facial hair indicate this being a different Frank than the one we're seeing right now. This is another important moment of continuity to indicate that this is a Frank maybe from the past, okay, or from Harmonica's mind. And we get this, this match pull-in between the two characters. The, the final pull-in here is going to reveal Harmonica's role in whatever has happened, whatever's been happening in the past. And we pull all the way into the eyes. Frank gets a matching pull-in here but it's the eyes that tip us off to who our other character is. And so the match, cut here, the match cuts here allow us to see this as Harmonica, our main hero, much younger, right? There's really no other way to distinguish this other than to focus on pulling into the eyes as a, as a mechanism. And that crane shot I mentioned earlier, that pull back and up, Leone mimics it again here to give us this, uh, this sort of reveal of the scope of the trauma that Frank has inflicted on, on Harmonica. I'd like to point out sound at this point, okay? Um, because as this, as this clip continues, what you're gonna notice is that harmonica sound you hear in the soundtrack suddenly becomes diegetic. Um, and it suddenly becomes harmonica breathing through his harmonica that's, that's stand, jammed in his mouth. Um, this is really strange and, and discontinuous choice for Leone to make because either the harmonica is coming from him or it's part of the soundtrack, but these two things bleed into each other um, in, in this part of the scene. You can hear the, the amelodic harmonica right now. I would also like you to pay attention to the pacing here. As the scene becomes more and more intense, the, sh the, dis the time between shots quickens. Okay? Start, start looking at and noticing how much quicker each cut is here as compared to the long, long takes we had at the beginning of this scene.
Do it. Cut, 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 cut. Just feel that pace picking up and quickening. But then, right at the climax of the scene, we get slow motion. And, and Leone does this to sort of emphasize that this is the long, long drawn out moment of agony for Harmonica's care, for Harmonica, right? This is the moment that he lingers on, and Leone forces us to linger on it as well. This is his failure. This, this, his fall is literally his failure. He's not strong enough to keep his brother supported, okay? And that's, that's his failure. So uh, all that build up, all, those, all, that, all that drawing out of the story, drawing out of the, the conflict, the reasons for being there, Leone spends six, seven minutes on. The actual violence that's supposed to redeem Harmonica, make him feel better about his trauma of his past, it's over like that, right? It's a flash, it's a flame, okay? So the way he, uh, the, Leone structures this like this on purpose, to sort of make a, a, a very subtle argument about why we need violence or why we think about violence as so positive as this thing that can help us get over trauma. Do you have any questions about anything so far? TA Megan, yes? <laughs> um, so this has been asking about human diagnosis. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the yeah, okay, absolutely. You can just repeat that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have talked about diagesis in the past in this class. Uh, with regards to uh, soundtracks, right, and sound mostly. Um, and, and I've, I've uh, asked you to think about diegesis as something that either, either happens in the real world or does not happen in the world, world of the character, okay? So is that music that's playing music that that character can hear, right? Is it coming out of the car that they're sitting in? That's diegetic. If it's music that that character cannot hear, then it's non-diegetic. I have a clip here from a Geico commercial. I don't know. Sort of silly to look at a commercial, but um, I think you all actually understand diegesis. And I think maybe the word diegesis is, is, is perhaps what's tripping us up here, okay? Um, because if you find this commercial funny or even slightly humorous, to me that indicates that you understand what diegesis is. Because the joke of this commercial is, is that something that we expect to be non diegetic is actually diegetic. So I heard plenty of laughs. Um, raise your hand if you thought that was humorous, even in the slice. Okay. What, what's humorous about it, though? What's humorous is that we know that that end title card, the end, is not something that's actually in the world of the cowboy, right? It's, it's something that we know that is, is, is non-diegetic. And so when he runs into it, the, the joke there is that it's working against your expectation of diegesis, right? That you expect this to be non-diegetic. Whoops, it's actually diegetic. That, that the end sign is actually in the world that the cowboy lives in, okay? Um, so hopefully that helps you all sort of solidify diegesis and think about how, how things can be diegetic or non-diegetic. Um, you know, within the clip, I was pointing it out to indicate that this soundtrack that we're hearing, that the characters cannot hear, um, suddenly that harmonica sound was part of the, part of the world of the characters, um, but we should understand that the rest of the sounds are not, they can't hear those, right? There's no string band in the background like playing that sound. Okay, uh, good question. I, I, were there any more? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, we went through Kuleshov. Uh The next thing that you all posted questions about um, was master scene or master shot. And I think that's an important thing to look at within editing. Um, your book describes it as something that, uh, a scene or a shot that uh, frames the upcoming scenes or shots in a very specific way by giving us a larger look at a space that's too big to, to contain in one shot, okay? Um, I thought about maybe the, uh, 
the, the clip from Goodfellas where we walk into the bar, right? He's narrating who the people are. That's a great example. Um, but the best example of all time is from Casablanca. Um, so I have this clip from Casablanca. And with regards to what master scene or master shot is, just pay attention to how in this shot you meet every character that is going to be important for the rest of the film. So the reason I love this Casablanca shot is because unlike that Goodfellas shot that just sets up the bar for us, right, and some of the main characters in that bar, the Casablanca master scene sets up everything for the entire rest of the movie. So it's the most masterful master scene um, I can imagine. So here we go with Casablanca, um, the clip of uh, Rick's American Cafe. So we start with a nice um, establishing shot, and remember I've talked a lot about how establishing shots are not about distance, they're about establishing a location. And so we start with this establishing shot, it's actually more of a long shot, um, of Rick's American Cafe, the exterior. And as we pull in, we're introduced to these characters. Now it's important to think about why not just shoot this as a, a, a long shot of the entire bar, get a real, a real large angle, wide screen lens, a, a wide angle lens, and take the whole thing in. Well, we don't want to do that because the goal of this is not to show you everyone in the bar, it's to get you the intimate peaks into six players that are going to be important in the future, okay? Uh, we focus on, a, on our piano player, okay? We move through the bar as a, as a human being. Like. And that intimacy is important so we can overhear conversations. The, the main theme of this movie is people trying to get out right, of Casablanca and needing visas and needing money and needing all these things to get out of that, out of that area to escape and being frustrated at every turn. And this, this desperation that this master shot indicates to us um, is going to be important for understanding motivations throughout the film. And beyond introducing us to the characters and motivations, this, this scene is also giving us insight into the atmosphere of, of Rick's cafe itself. Right? This, this shot in particular is, is letting us in on the sort of um, grandiosity of Rick's American cafe. How important and popular Rick is in this, uh, in this area. Um, how well known he is. How much everyone wants to see him and be part of him. Which juxtaposes with our next shot, which indicates Rick's solitude and his desire to keep himself off, uh, cut off from everyone. This movie is about isolationism, right? In, uh, as, as the United States thought about World War, entering into World War II, and Rick's isolation is a reflection of that isolationism um, that the United States is undergoing. So, seeing him, it's not loud anymore here. He's very quiet. He's very alone. That should help you understand Master Shot, hopefully. Uh, master Scene, what it does, okay? And the way in which the editing of that shot gives us literally the, all the information we'll ever need to know. Here's who the characters are that are important in this movie. Here's what their motivations are. Here's what they're doing. Here's the main location of this uh, film, okay? So, so that makes it a Master Scene, okay? It contains all the composite parts that we'll, um, that we'll need. Okay, um, so another thing that, that seemed really uh, important, some things that, you, that, that were uh, needed clarification, I suppose. Um, I hope this works. Okay. Uh, we're screen direction. And a lot of you were asking me about screen direction and how, um, what's the 180 degree rule? Okay. Um, and this is, this is sort of important stuff with regards to editing. Okay. Um, so the 180 degree rule is not really a rule. Um, you can break that rule. Um, so it's not a hard and fast rule. That's sort of the first and most important thing to notice. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to sort of try to draw you a diagram because there is not really a scene that does this because if it did it, it would be like a fourth wall breaking type of scene. Okay. So we're going to imagine uh, a two character shot. All right. Think about that long shot we had in once upon a time in the West, where the two men 
are staring each other down, right? Okay. And in a 180 degree rule scene, our camera can be anywhere on this axis, okay? But it should not cross this imaginary line. This is a top down view, by the way. Okay? So we can put our camera here, or here, or here, but we don't want to put our camera here if we're trying to maintain continuity. And so let's think about what these shots look like. Okay? If our camera is right here, okay, that shot's going to have us have red guy on the left, very close to the screen, and blue guy on the right, farther away. Okay. What about this shot right here? Red guys on the left, and blue guys on the right. We're maintaining continuity. What about this shot right here? Here we have a blue guy close in the frame on the right, and red guy farther away on the left. Notice in all three shots, that left to right orientation is maintained. That's continuity. Okay? This shot here, suddenly we have a red guy far away on the right, and blue guy close up on the left. This is a break in continuity, okay? Because suddenly that left to right relationship is broken, and the person we thought or understood to be on the right is now on the left side of the screen. Okay. That's an important part of continuity because when you're cutting between different scenes, we need to maintain enough of that juxtaposition that the audience can tell where is this happening. Okay. However, I, like I said, this isn't a rule. This can be broken intentionally. If a director wants to create disorientation or confusion, this might be a great time to break that 180 degree rule. Okay. But generally, unless you want your audience to feel disoriented about where they are and where these characters are vis-a-vis -vis the camera and in the room, you generally want, going to want to adhere to this imaginary line here, okay, that keeps the characters on the same spot. So I have a really good example of this not working or, or intentionally, uh, an intentionally uh, discontinuous shot. Um, this is from the, the, four, the first Bourne movie, um, The Bourne Identity. And this is a fight scene. And uh, you know, I remember seeing this movie for the first time in the theater and thinking, wow, this, these action scenes were incredible. But incredibly what I could not quite say at the time. Um, they're incredibly hard to follow, right? If you've seen, uh, you guys have seen the Bourne movies, you know that these action scenes are sort of a flurry. And I think um, uh, what Greengrass is trying to do here is capture an essence of the confusion and disorientation of being in an intense physical fight. Okay? He wants you to be disoriented because that's how the characters are experiencing this. And because he's cutting like this quickly, like half a second, quarter second cuts, and we're constantly flipping our screen direction, there's no way for you to understand really well where they even are. Are they in the hallway? Are they in a room? Where are they vis-a-vis -vis each other? It totally puts you out of that. And all you can focus on is movement and action. That's what he wants you looking at, okay, is movement and action. He doesn't want you trying to figure out uh, where these characters are. He doesn't keep any take long enough for you to really figure it out, okay? So this is the clip from, from the Bourne film. Whoops, I should probably switch back to, to the PC, shouldn't I? Okay, there we go. All right, I'll start it over. So while you watch this, pay attention, see if you can even follow, or actually I'd say, see how long it takes you before you give up on trying to follow how many cuts you see. And think about how that pace of cutting works along with this 180 degree rule to create a discontinuous and disorienting scene, okay? So these things work together.
Okay. How many cuts did you see? <laughs> 2,000, maybe. Um, enough cuts that you probably gave up after five to 10 seconds, right? Generally, that there's no point in counting the amount of cuts. Let's just say it's a lot, okay? What about screen direction? This is, this is I think, important to notice, like when these, when these events happen, I can think of a specific scene in the hallway where we get a shot behind our killer guy and Jason's on his right. And then when we cut, Jason's on the left and here's our killer guy. And it totally disorients you. Until we get into that room where they're fighting with the desk, you have no visual reference, right? There's no object you can look at to say, oh, okay, here's what side of the room they're on. He has them fight in a hallway for that very specific reason that he wants, you to, he wants to be able to disorient you and constantly have you focus just on movement because you can't know anything else about these characters' relationship where they're at in, in rooms. So um, this is not, but again, I want to stress, this is not bad filmmaking. This is intentional discontinuity, okay? He, he, wants that, he wants to do that, he wants to use these quick edits to force you, um, to force you out of a habit of trying to gain as much visual information as possible. He's only giving you enough to notice movement and the flow and the action that's happening. Um, you barely have time to recognize who's who in some of these shots, right? Um, no, excuse, or no coincidence, they're also wearing very similar colored shirts, right? He wants that to just be a blur of movement, okay? Now let's contrast that. Not, not with, uh, not looking at screen direction, because I think y'all should be getting, getting that at this point. Um, but let's look at pacing and how the pacing of a shot determines what we're taking in and what we're noticing about different, um, different types of shots, okay? Um, so in contrast to the Bourne clip, I have this clip from season one of Daredevil. Um, and this is sort of a well-known, famous, long take. Um, and and this, this, this show gets a lot of, um, a lot of props and, and I think rightfully deserved for the cinematography and, and this being one of the things that, that viewers point to as this long take. Now this is not actually one long take. There's some clever edits um, as the camera spins around real quickly in the hallway um, that allow them to disguise when they cut. There's actually about three cuts in this scene. Um, but you won't notice them unless, unless you're looking really closely. Now contrast this with the Bourne clip you just watched. First of all, like I said, it's disguised to have zero edits. So you're looking at a three minute and one second scene with no cuts, okay? Also focus on where, where the camera's located and what types of information we're getting. So the camera remains in, in the exact same space in this hallway, but the characters are sort of breaking these, these frames constantly. And we get uh, several shots of nothing. And all we can do is hear things, all right? But what I'd like you to focus on here is pacing. And what you notice uh, when we're not getting cuts this quickly? What, how do you experience this action scene differently? Do you have a preference, okay? Um, do you think one, uh, basically look at what you can get out of the different, sh different shots and whether you think one captures a certain type of action better than the other. Okay, so here's a clip from Daredevil.
Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I'd like you to go home or go to uh, the recitation on Friday thinking about what more you got out of, or what different things, I guess not more, but what different things were you able to capture from that long take? Um, what different types of visual information do you get from that long take? Um, I think one of the key things we're trying to illustrate in this, this second shot, the second scene, is the exhaustion that fighters experience, right? That we definitely do not get from a born scene, which is just filled to the brim with kinetic action constantly, all right? Um, whereas the Daredevil scene, we, we sort of miss out on a lot of action, but what we're, get, we're getting is um, this, this, this way in which the fighting is tiring for him. It's a sort of a sacrifice. He's constantly pushing himself to the edge, as well as several other things. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so the, you also wanted to, to talk about match cuts, although uh, the TAs told me that the match cuts you were kind of good on, it was the graphic matches that you weren't really getting. And I can see that um, <laughs> the graphic matches are sort of hard to describe. Um, you know, generally when we're looking at match cuts, we're again thinking about the cool shove effect and how directors want to match or juxtapose or force you to see two images together in a very specific way. You know, we have cut on action, that one seems like you, you understood that pretty well. Graphic matches um, do something different. They allow people to juxtapose, I'm just going to let this play for a second. This is from 2001, this clip, um, <clears throat> and I'll talk while it's in the background. What, these, uh, what a graphic match allows a director to do is juxtapose two different visual ideas, okay? So in 2001, you know, we open with this, well, we don't open, but several minutes in the film, um, we have this scene where apes sort of learn to use technology after touching the obelisk. And the technology they learn to use is bones or weapons or tools, essentially, okay? And what Kubrick shows us is this way in which the acquisition of knowledge or, or the ability to use tools allows tribe number one to overpower tribe number two that does not understand how to use weapons. Um, and what he immediately matches to, or I guess we could, we could pull it forward a little bit here after they beat the other apes to death, um, <laughs> what he matches to uh, is the ape sort of tossing the bone up in triumph and we get a graphic match then of the spaceship hurtling through space. And so what Kubrick wants us to do is see those two, uh, those two objects as being related in some way, right? He wants to force you to see the bone as being related to the spaceship in some way. And I think it's pretty obvious after watching the movie um, that what he's making an argument about is this sort of like violent potential of technology. The way technology sort of like all it really does is bring forth this inherent violence and, and stupidity and, and uh, sort of um, absurdity of human existence or pre-human existence. Okay, so we get this, there, that's the match cut, okay? Right there to there, as the bone cuts to the spaceship. The, the graphic match means that the bone graphically matches the spaceship, right? So the bone is shaped like this and the spaceship is shaped like this, those two images have a graphic similarity. That's all a graphic match is, okay, is, is that similarity between those two things. <clears throat> okay, we are running short on time. So, uh, I did get to all your questions, that's good, I was happy about that. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is sort of bring us back to continuity and sort of wrap today up by, by focusing on how continuity um, can work uh, in a larger scale throughout a movie, okay. So Memento, we've seen Memento. A memento is a really great example of this, right? Because um, memento uh, is a discontinuous story arc, right? So we have, um, if we're looking at the story arc here, um, like plot and story, okay? Um, remember, this is the narrative, uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is the narrative arc, this is how we see the movie, okay? Um, so me memento, you know, starts at the beginning and works backwards. And then we cut to the earliest scene, and then we cut back here, and then we cut back here, and then we cut back here, and here, and here, and here, over and over again, until the, the storylines merge. And how Nolan creates continuity is through a really simple mechanism of color, right? He uses color to create this continuity. Um, so, you know, we start, and um, we have 
color scenes, these are the scenes that are moving backwards. Okay? The color scenes are the ones that are moving backwards. We start at the end and we work backwards. And the black and white scenes which should be coming over here. Just a second. Okay, the black and white scenes are the scenes that start at the, at the narrative beginning and are working forward as well. Okay, so we're, we're working towards this merger. And what Nolan does to create continuity is right here at the end of the film when Leonard confronts Jimmy Gantz. And Nolan does this in a way uh, where he, he has the saturation slowly bleed in as the storylines merge. And which is a really brilliant way to create continuity because Leonard is obsessed with Polaroid photos, right? And, and you guys might be too young for Polaroids, but like, this is how a Polaroid works, is like, they, they slowly bleed, the color, the image slowly bleeds in, okay? And what we learn, this, this story is not about Leonard's plot to, uh, to catch his wife's killer. But we don't learn that to the end. What we learn in the end is that this story is about our understanding of Leonard as a character, right? So the audience, the viewership, we're the major players in this story. As we slowly learn more and more about Leonard and learn that his noble chivalrous quest is actually not that noble of chivalrous and is actually pretty terrible um, because he's murdering innocent people, okay? So here's the moment when he confronts uh, Jimmy, Okay, so as the color comes in, this is supposed to be a moment of realization for the audience that, uh, where these two storylines merge. If we don't get this final scene here where, they, where the color bleeds in from the black and white, the story does not make much sense, right? It's a very, it's a very uh, discontinuous story. Um, the, the narrative line is not working. Um, we're constantly jumping back and forth between past and present. It's color, which is, which is done in, in post-production. The desaturation is actually what happens in post-production. They film the entire thing in color um, and then desaturate. And you can tell that because the black and whites are not actually that black and white. Um, but regardless, what's, what Nolan does to create continuity is this color match point. Okay? When, when that saturates, um, we understand those two storylines as having merged. And his attempt here is to create a continuity out of a very, very garbled and discontinuous storyline. And he does it with something as simple as a color choice. Okay. All right, if you have any questions, please post those on the Facebook group. Talk to your TAs on Friday. I'll be happy to respond to them next week. Thank you all.